Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Stripped by Sia, your podcast for strippers, sex workers, and all the fancy naked people in between. I am your host, Steph Sia, aka Kimchi, on stage. And yes, there are some dates where you can now catch me on stage again. I'll be returning back to, uh, actually not returning, but like my first time will be at Status uh, Nightclub in Vernon. So if you happen to be in wine country in British Columbia in the Okanagan, you can find me there for one night only on May 17th so just in a couple weeks from now so be sure to come say hi tip me um if you want to take me for a dance and talk about the show i would love that people have done that before and it's great so thank you thank you um if not you can also catch me online um i am an adult content creator so i do have an only fans you could find that somewhere on the interwebs uh and of course uh streaming i have not been online lately but when i am online it's on streaming exclusively exclusively under the name Sia on camera. So if you're brand new here, hi, welcome. Um, we're almost at the end of season six, so you have a lot of episodes to catch up on. I will de- let you do and um, catch up on all those episodes. Um, but this is a show all about destigmatizing sex work, and I do that by bringing different guests onto the show every single week uh, to speak about their corner of the industry and how they contribute to the industry, whether they are an online content creator like myself, maybe they're some on-screen uh, talent in the porn industry, um, or if they are from a nonprofit organization, um, if they are a professor, which is what we're having on for today, uh, which I'm super excited to talk about. But again, really trying to paint um, and illustrate a really clear picture of what sex work is. No glamorization here. No sensationalization here. Um, We do talk about the good and the bad. So sometimes for episodes, there might be some triggers. I'm hoping there will be no triggers today. But if not, if there is, then we'll definitely mention it later on the show. Um, or I'll make another announcement um, once I am at, done editing this one. But uh, yeah, so this whole show is just to, the aim is to really educate folks um, on the industry, on its workers, um, and yeah, really help to destigmatize the work. Because as you might know, it's like a highly, highly stigmatized profession. So um, I do have, as I mentioned, a professor that is going to be coming onto the show to talk about uh, a bit about feminist theory, uh, a little bit of sociology here as well, sexuality, and how these roots in feminism, how that has affected sex working laws, sex workers, and we're basically, I'm, I'm super excited for the lecture today <laughs> um, with Dr. Brandy Weeb. So please stay tuned. We are going to get there in another minute. And if you want to skip the ne- this next minute, I just have to thank my Patreon subscribers online. Um, if you don't know what Patreon is, it's, it's a way for you as a listener, as a fan, to help financially contribute to the show because as you might know this is all free resources that is accessible to you for you to share for you to access at any point there's no there's no paywall or anything here um but there are some bonus episodes that i put on to my patreon lots of video exclusives that is uh available ahead of time before the public, before these episodes come out. You can kind of get to see who I'm bringing onto the show, what kind of topics I plan to be tackling, especially right now for I'm trying to brew up for season seven, which is happening very, very soon. So if you want more of those extra tidbits, um, please, please, please please consider becoming a patron. They do, we do have tiers starting for as low as $4 a month. Um, And again, there's lots of different perks you can see up on there, but it is updated multiple multiple times a week at the minimum for right now because I'm going on vacation <laughs> at the time of recording. It's going to be like once a week, but um, this patreon.com slash stripped by Sia and you can check out the different tiers there. Um, so as I mentioned, I have to do a quick little shout out here. I'll be really quick because we have a lot to talk about today, but I just want to say hello to Snoo Snoo from Germany. We've got Justin Erickson from Vancouver, Washington. We've got Geyser, Selena Money. We've got um, Dan from Red Door Products in Seattle. We've also got McKenna King from Edmonton, who is also a past guest on the show. Really, really great episode there. Bea York, also from Seattle, also a past guest on the show too. Moxie Mayhem. And we also have Eric Araujo. Thank you all so much for just con- 
considering donating some money um, to the show. If you want to know where that money is going to, it's basically for website hosting. And if I'm ever attending adult industry events, it's exactly where your money is going. So check it out. Patreon.com slash strip by Sia. Five minutes right on the dot for all that stuff. So now we can finally get to the good stuff. And Dr. Brandy Weep has been waiting patiently in the wings right now. I'm super excited stoked to finally have her on because if you did not know and I've kind of like mentioned it a couple times in the show but I do do participate in a lot of vanilla work as well um working in uh sexual health education um as an operations and online business manager I am not a sexual health educator but (laughs) aligned I guess I feel like I've learned so much (laughs) in the past few years but Brandy here is a lot of things I will say yes from where we know each other is through a comprehensive sexual health education. She is an educator at the company that I work for. Um, also is a professor in the Department of Sociology at the University of British Columbia. Um, lots of main research areas would be sex, gender, and sexuality. Um, also talking about the sociology of health. Um, and some of the courses she is currently teaching is human sexuality, feminist theory, which is kind of what we're talking a bit about today, and sociology of sexuality. So I am super stoked to finally make this partnership happen. Brandy, are you there? I am here. Thank you so, so, so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> I am super stoked. And I'm just very excited that you would, you're even interested or remotely interested in collaborating with me and talking and nerding it out today about all of the things that you are an expert on. So I'm, I'm so honored and very excited for this next hour to just be educated and for me to be a sponge and me pretending to be a student in your lecture hall. <laughs> I love it. And you know, this is what brings joy to my heart is you mentioned nerding out. I feel like I'm deeply, deeply, deeply a sex nerd. Like that is, <laughs> that is who I am in the world. So I'm, I'm ecstatic to be uh, talking and learning and sharing. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Like I've mentioned, if you missed it earlier, if you're skipping forward, we are talking about like feminism, um, kind of even maybe defining what feminism is, going into how that might affect sex work, how that is deeply ingrained in some of the laws that we now have specifically here in the Canadian context. Um, but before we get into the meat and bones of the episode, uh, Brandy, I'd love to get the audience to know you a bit better as well. So I know what is publicly available on the internet, very little on the internet, but I always like to throw back to the guests to describe themselves however they feel comfortable and whatever words and terms would like to use. So feel free to go ahead. Amazing. Thank you. Um, well, let's see who I am. So I think of myself as being in the world to support people around healing false, shameful beliefs around sexuality, that there's anything unclean, un, you know, um, dirty, shameful about our beautiful, amazing sexuality in all the amazing ways that we show up. Um, so that's looked like teaching, uh, kids and their parents, uh, in schools, uh, right from the get go to create healthy orientations, understandings of human sexuality. Um, but I also have that started by me getting my PhD in feminist sociology, specializing in sexuality. Um, I just, uh, quickly, I, um, <laughs> I'll say my, One of my deepest passions within feminism is supporting sex worker rights. To me, anyone that is committed to gender equality needs to check themselves if they're not automatically assuming that sex worker rights are deeply, profoundly important to empowering all human beings. Yes. So I will, yeah, and I, I'd like to get, well, eventually we'll get into like where that comes from and these ideas. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll be able to put a little bit of theory to the things that um, experience, you know, sex workers and sex worker allies already know. So uh, that's my little wedge to, to support <laughs> the circle. <laughs> <laughs> Which is awesome. And it's, a, it's such, a, such a great attitude to have as well. Because I mentioned to you off air, there's a lot of folks that are wanting to support sex workers' rights, but also don't know how to get involved. Or it's maybe very, very so far away from their 
regular every day to day life. So this I'm hoping will be a really great episode in terms of resources and to get people properly equipped and educated on topic. Um, before we get into that, even before we get into that, maybe we can talk a little bit about you as well in terms of like how you started in researching or like how, where this interest even was born out of like wherever you want to start though, Brandy. Yes. Feel free to start okay. anywhere. <laughs> Amazing. Ooh, it's so easy talking about me. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I entered the world of sexuality as an undergraduate uh, at the University of Alberta. The My university sexual assault support center came into my sociology of gender class and did a little presentation and I was set on fire. Like I realized sort of just what was possible in regards to we don't need to just leave the world as it, as it was given to us. We can make big, drastic, beautiful changes. And so I volunteered at, I volunteered there for a number of years. Um, and I, it's invaluable work. And I really started to feel vibrationally for me that working with the sort of potentially negative outcomes around sexuality isn't where I wanted to put my energy. I wanted to uh, start um, kind of, you know, eventually working with kids, but also in the university level, like deconstructing, you know, all, all of these, uh, a lot of the negativity, right, around our own sexual expressions. This is, of course, manifested most blatantly in regards to sex workers. Um, I then, in at the beginning of my PhD, I started slightly differently. It was more around activism, but then my dad actually died when I was about 27. No, thank you. It's just, it's a, it was an important moment. And so I had a, a small little, a little, small little inheritance. And with that money, I put part of it to saying yes to everything in the world that came across wow. my, my desk. And what came across my desk, I didn't have a desk when I was a kid, but you know, <laughs> in my mid twenties, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> what was presented was the opportunity to do a sexual health educator certification class. Yeah. With options for sexual health, which is, I'm now a board member on actually, um, but they're like BC's Planned Parenthood organization was supporting uh, sexual health basically. And um, I was able in that two month intensive chorus over the summer to transition all of my helpful, important feminist theor theoretical backgrounds and transition that to the, the ground. If not, like, I don't want to make it just into the community. And I thought I had been coming from a pro-sex feminist perspective, but until I was challenged really, really deeply by people that were already working in the community, supporting people, it radically transformed everything that I sort of thought uh, a feminist theory could offer. I thought I was doing good wow. and I wasn't. <laughs> How? Oh, how? No, that's a big realization, though, it too, was. because, you know, there there are a lot of organizations that really are convinced that they are doing good for the community. But in reality, they're only doing a portion of good for a portion of the community and well, excluding others. Yes. Which I'm sure we're going to get into. Yeah. Later yeah and and well. it's such a good point, right? Because, um, oh, uh, Unless our work is based on what experience people within the, the labor market in this particular example, sex work, unless we're doing exactly what people that have the experience are saying, this is what I need. It's not of service, right? That's about something else, not, not being of service to the community that you want to, to, you want to thrive and support. Oh, absolutely. 100%. Um, I know that we can definitely talk more about you, but I am also just looking at this mountain of notes yes. as well, <laughs> which like I'm super excited to get into, but this is a really, really great. Thank you again for sharing, yeah. by the way, yeah. context to understand like how you got here. So yeah. that is really, really great. Thank you. I do need to do one tiny one second shout out for uh, oh, sure. a mentor of mine. Uh, Dr. Becky Ross was on my PhD um, supervisorial committee and has done amazing, fierce support of sex workers, particularly um, street level sex workers on the uh, West End of Vancouver and exposing just what the, the devastating impact uh, of sex work laws in Canada and the pushing yes. out of sex workers from the West End uh, and, you know, from visible public space generally uh, has done. So uh, to Becky Ross, 
Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh my God. Is this a, okay? Maybe I'm confused, but is Becky Ross also the author of Burlesque West? Yes. The book? Indeed. Oh my God. Amazing yes. book. Yes. 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 So, yes. <laughs> and it's very like local too to British Columbia Absolutely. as well. So if anyone's interested in some literature, would highly recommend Burlesque West by Becky Ross, which I've read many, many years ago when I was kind of getting into this advocating space too, but shout out. And I'll, maybe I'll plug that into the show notes as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, just, yes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I maybe think, maybe think like we should define, and maybe you might be tired of this question, but I'm also curious to hear what your definition is, but maybe to start this whole conversation off, um, what is your definition of feminism? Okay, maybe you can start there. Perfect. So for me, it is addressing and trying to ameliorate the intersections of um, inequalities that cycle through basically settler, racist, patriarchal society. So gender, you know, certainly uh, as a white woman, that's uh, an aspect of uh, inequality that I know a lot about. Uh, but I'm deeply committed to learning, right, again, experientially from others about, you know, how all these other intersections um, it, show up, right, and how we can be addressing them in this settler patriarchal context. Yeah. And speaking of, like, settler, settler patriarchal context, there's obviously, like, a lot of that, as you mentioned, that is rooted in feminism. Um, maybe we can kind of talk about those roots because they're those are deep 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 deep, 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 deep. roots when I was thinking yeah. about uh joining you uh, I always think <laughs> of any conversation like this if you want to call the lecture I hope it's not experienced in that way by anyone <laughs> <laughs> I think of it like a story I'm telling you a story right about these things mm -hmm. and and making connections right and drawing a storyline right. it's artificial you know it's Brandy's story um but <laughs> I hope that it's a, a fluid way to do that so I was thinking I need to begin this story by indeed, right? Thinking about um, after the accumulation of money and resources that happened, uh, you know, based on the slave economy, uh, ca colonialism spread not only um, like really very European Christian values, specifically around sexuality. So looking at the Christian settler state is critical, right? Because that certainly, uh, as North Americans, uh, other areas of the world as well have been really um, impacted by this, but us on Turtle Island, um, it's how, even if we don't believe in any of these Christian ideas, even if we weren't raised at all, they're built right into the ethos of the settler state of North America. Mm -hmm. So we need to start there. Um, may I right. continue? I, I... Oh my God, please, okay. <laughs> please continue. I'm like absorbing everything. I'm just a sponge here right I now. Love so. it. I love it. Thank <laughs> you. So that's the background. One of the major, um, so I guess the background to this story is when I say anyone interested in gender equality, any, and in, all inequality, I feel mm -hmm. it's so critical that they be committed to sex worker rights. So this is my right. Answer, okay. So first we have the settler colonial state. Um, that's the same thing. I repeated myself. My apologies. <laughs> no, you're all good. You're all good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so within that Christian settler state, there's um, what historians have called the mind body dichotomy. Okay. When I articulate this, maybe, you know, think about how the connections, you know, for your, for listeners, about how you've seen this in your own life. You didn't necessarily have the phrase, this fancy little academic word to attach it to, but you might have had this sense. So the mind-body dichotomy is the Christian belief that our mind is what takes us up to either a spiritual God of some sort or gotcha. within science, you know, as science as a story for how to understand the world became a more uh, dominant or powerful story than religion uh, in settler, um, settler, settler societies, mm -hmm. the, the mind then lifted us to intellectual enlightenment. Okay. The other yeah. side of the dichotomy is the body, the body within this very Christian um, perspective is what drags us down into sin, desire. Oh, uh, yes. Gotcha. And this yes. is at the heart of inequality because all groups connected with the mind. So men, white folks, 
uh, masters, cap, you know, uh, industries of capitalism, no, magnets <laughs> of capitalism, whatever, <laughs> really, really privileged people. <laughs> Right. Those are what are associated with the mind and other groups, for example, women, racialized folks, indigenous folks in the settler context, other settler subjects, uh, colonial subjects, uh, folks with disabilities. All of those folks are associated with the body. The body? Exactly. Okay. And so the justification is that, you know, we were all taught growing up, you can't just follow your body around willy nilly. <laughs> you have to use <laughs> your strong mind to discipline and to control the body. Okay. Right. And this is important because we were taught that groups associated with the mind, men, white folks, you know, all, all those things, settlers. Mm-hmm. They should be in charge. It's law. Right. It justifies patriarchy, racism, ableism, uh, colonialism. Right. So the next step of that, so women are deeply right uh, linked with the body as the body, other right? um, mm-hmm. groups that are less privileged. Um, mm-hmm. Then we get into how we understand femininity within the settler patriarchy. There's at its heart, I'm sure you've talked about this many times on this show in many ways. There's what sociologists, as nerds, would make a big fan of <laughs> <laughs> the good girl, bad girl dichotomy. But in yes. essence, this is just slut shaming, right? Like that, that's, that's at its simple, at its you know, most uh, common usage parlance. So the good girl, di- good girl, bad girl dichotomy is that femininity that can be valued, even though it's lesser than masculinity within Mm -hmm. patriarchy, what femininity we can value is domestic, controlled, monogamous, um, married, reproductive femininity. Okay. Right. Everything outside of that becomes suspect, less desirable, less worthy of protection. Would a couple right. of examples here be useful? I, like, I, I don't know. Sure, yeah. please. Um, we so love that. For example, um, imagine the uh, the white settler body, how it's positioned relative to the indigenous feminine body. And okay. the belief is similar to the history of the impact of these sorts of discourses of black women in the U.S. There's, there's mm-hmm. some real parallels. This gets into it so many like 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 lots there's so much we're 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 sliding over the top here but we yeah. I cannot do this justice <laughs> but sliding over the top it's that white femininity in these contexts are valued as what you know is women should be right but then right. Uh, other body yeah like you know indigenous and black bodies in this context are seen as i, I use this completely to illustrate the absolute nonsense and indignity of this, but treated like garbage, right? right. Treated like they uh, have, should be touched, cat called, you know, um, mm. solicited in public space in ways that you don't see showing up because of the good girl, bad girl dichotomy. Is that a useful, right. is that helpful? Oh my mm-hmm. gosh. Yeah. Very, very useful. Like, and it's also like another dichotomy too, more so in psychology, but like the Madonna and the whole yes, complex the as well. Parallel. Yeah. 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 Oh my gosh. Yes. <laughs> yes to all this. And I'm, I'm sure that a lot of listeners are too, are also kind of nodding their heads in agreement <laughs> with this 100%. Um, I know you were, you wanted to talk about horror stigma as well, yes. Brandy. Yes. Yep. That's yeah. the one last one. I was like, oh, I have one more. <laughs> no, I was like, there's more, there's more. <laughs> Quick review. We got the settler patriarchy. (laughs) Yeah. We have within that the mind body dichotomy, women associated with the body. We then have the good girl, bad girl dichotomy. The good girl at least has some protection by being linked with male protection. The bad girl is, you know, what's tossed aside in society. This ultimately intersects with um, other inequalities like colonialism, racism, things like this in the lives of sex workers via what's yes. referred to as the whore stigma. So first, right. just to start with the definition, again, I know that all of the, well, not maybe not all the people listening, but <laughs> people 
directly um, uh, experience in the sex work industry have experienced this, whether it's as simple as not feeling comfortable to tell family members and friends, hey, this is how I make my money. This is uh, how I contribute to the labor force, right? So the horse stigma are beliefs and stereotypes that are yes. projected onto sex workers in ways that are specifically dehumanizing. Right? Yes. So it's so this is the ultimate. So it's like I think of it like this: sex workers are the ultimate bad girl. They are unrepentant, right? Mm -hmm. They are making money on what is supposed to be the most fearful thing in their life, well, you know, distancing yourself from being the bad girl. Instead, humans for millennia, as long as we've existed, <laughs> have embraced them. I mean, like this is taking, you know, taking that power for themselves in a very small, unique way that is offered to women, disproportionately queer women, right? This is a space where they can uh, create income, right? And community and resistance. Oh, totally. No, this is a really great kind of backstory in a history lesson as well too in order for us to continue on with our conversation today and how that is rooted in in feminism yes. too and yes. this is now going to take me back to my women's studies days back when I was in my undergrad over a decade ago <laughs> but um I know that you want to talk about like the three waves in feminism as well and maybe we can do quick spark notes on that because yeah. i also need a bit of a re refresher as well. i love it and <laughs> excellent segueing if i may <laughs> <laughs> it's all you brandy all you don't take any credit <laughs> so um okay so generally people that like to think about these things this handful of humans <laughs> Yes. parse the fem Western feminist movement into what we call three waves. Um, just quickly, first wave is what typically you would associate with the suffragettes, right? Basically women agitating the vote. We're going to disrupt that story. And that's where the main, where the, the heart of this really is going to be. Second wave is the quote unquote women's movement as, as it emerged in the 1960s, 1970s, alongside a lot of other civil uh, civil movements, right? So uh, black rights in the US, voting rights for mm -hmm. racialized folks in Canada, things like that, right? right. Um, and then now we typically identify the third wave. Some people, this doesn't matter, but some folks are arguing whether we're in a fourth. That's a whole other right. thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, from sort of the 90s onwards. And this is mm -hmm. this... Um, just a more more uh, tech based, um, textual based. Started, you know, like little, you know, uh, young women creating zines and things like that. Right. And, and now has as this is what we are experiencing beautifully online. So okay, gotcha. uh, those are the the three waves ish. Okay. Now the first wave is where the story and where this foundation of misunderstanding <laughs> at the yeah. <laughs> When yeah. feminist theory um, occurs. Now, I just want to take a quick note, of course, when we say feminist, as you know, uh, a lot of your listeners will know, there are many streams. The folks who have taken, um, who are uh, what we often call sex worker exclusionary radical feminists, so sports, yes. are this very mm -hmm. specific subset, if I may, um, but they are absolutely there. But there's also yes. pro-sex feminist theory, which I hope to convince you is a viable option. <laughs> <laughs> they exist. We exist. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> so in the third wave, when we think of suffragettes, okay, this is important. The first wave of feminists were um, in the Western, in the Western context, basically uh, white women, though all women have always been fighting <laughs> for this. Yes. The story we're told, who we remember, you know, Mm -hmm. rightly or wrongly, of course, um, they were actually abolitionists. Abolitionism mm -hmm. is the wanting to abolish something. So when we think of abolitionism, we think of the uh, abolition of alcohol in the U.S. in the 1920s, right? All those old movies you've seen <laughs> where they're yes. in their bathtub, that's what it's yes. all about. <laughs> <laughs> But the sex story, which is, of course, the story that is often erased in our history, 
was they were trying to abolish uh, the consumption of alcohol, uh, but also they were trying to abolish sex work. Yeah. Okay. Correct. So this is the part that was lost that people kind of forget in the ethers. But the only point they didn't, they weren't committed to uh, getting the vote because they had some eloquent, like, you know, theoretical argument. <laughs> um, <laughs> they didn't get the vote because, you know, men in the world were like, oh, let's be lovely and become increasingly self aware. World War One happened. They needed folks to vote. <laughs> yeah. So totally. <laughs> um, what was happening is they simply were want wanting to get the vote. Suffragettes were wanting to get the vote to make changes. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the famous uh, Nellie McClung. There's a really famous. I might butcher it. I'm 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 off notes here, but <laughs> <laughs> the good. most famous uh, quote from Nellie McClung, a famous first wave um, Canadian suffragette, was that women's responsibility is in the home. And outside of the home, if they can make a difference for changing the lives of women and children. Basically, they're like, guys, you screwed this all up. You know, we need to take over. So that's why they're looking for the vote. So you have that abolition, gotcha. the intention to abolish sex work, which not uncommonly within a context where there's patriarchy, there's the good girl, bad girl dichotomy, and there's the horse stigma, their projections onto sex work were they're 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 resisting patriarchy, but they're still part of it. And parts of that story, including an anti-sex work ethic uh, at the heart of, you know, a lot of strains of feminism that had to be undo undone later is still there. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, that's great. I mean, this is like, we talk about this because this, this seems like it was so long ago too, but you'll see as we, we get into it later on as well, that how, not much has changed in a certain way. And a lot of these values and these morals are still very much apparent as well. Yes. Um, a yes. really quick connection there. Thank you for saying the morals. One of the promises, this is not to, to not to get political, but you know, like one of the promises of our current, um, so if you don't know, it doesn't matter. <laughs> well, of our current <laughs> federal government in Canada was to make evidence-based policy. And... Our sex work laws, mm. the, the, the conservative government that was in, 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 in leadership before were the people that reenacted the sex work laws, as we'll get into. Right. But I yes. just want to highlight basing public policy on morality, as we, you know, as we see in sex work is, <sighs> and many other areas, is deeply, deeply painful. Like, like it, it, it yeah. dishonors humans. Yes. Yeah. And is highly discriminatory exactly. against certain parties. And I just feel like, I don't know what it is with laws nowadays, but not just talking about sex workers only, but I just feel like there's a new resurgence of this making another cycle again and taking us back to this time where it, it is for me deemed historical and old school and like things that we just don't do anymore. But, you know, talking about like Roe v. Wade and talking about these like anti-trans um, movements and anti-sex work, anti-porn, anti-everything. It, it seems like we're going back into that time mm. where feminism was just emerging yeah. again. Yeah. But it's, it's a really cycle because we haven't healed any of the underneath Right. Like mm -hmm. if you take that to be true, the horse stigma, the good girl, bad girl, if you were taught it all your life, there's no one's like the, the work is about healing those deeply mistaken myths or like or like, right. like misinformation that some human could be less than another in any way, shape or form of less value. Right. That's garbage. It's just not true. <laughs> No, absolutely. I mean, continuing on, though, yeah. Brandy, yeah. talking about um, feminism and its impacts on sex workers during this time, do you have any insight during this time on how sex workers were being treated? I know, like, and I'm just, like, basing it back on, actually, Becky Ross's books yeah. <laughs> with Burlesque West, too, and, like, talking about specifically, um, like, sex workers – I think during like the sixties and the seventies too, specifically in Vancouver, mm -hmm. talking about how those were actually a lot of people of color mm. that were in strip clubs historically, those who are exotified or othered yeah. Yeah. and stuff as well. I know we're going into a tangent. This wasn't in the notes, but like if you want to chime in, I'm, I'm please, super please, curious. Please, please. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm sponging it up too. 
<laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe what was your take on that too? If you can add any insight to in terms of like what folks were feeling at this time. Um, so just to clarify, my apologies, are we thinking mm-hmm. like in like the, the first wave of feminism, kind of the twenties or maybe second wave, I think second more so wave. in the okay. second wave. Yeah. Um, well, wh- is there much, uh, it, li- literature out there that was documenting this at this time? Cause I know sometimes when we're talking about sex work research, there's actually not a lot. It's this is exactly available, um, which is not to mm-hmm. say it's it's much more likely to honestly exist now where we're going back to interview elders, which is yes. where we get this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful knowledge from. But my experience uh, of the literature generally is more about the detrimental impact of the laws on sex workers. Mm-hmm. And as you yes. point out, it's always intersectional because, for example, street level sex workers, which you know, uh, the the numbers I always use, and please uh, disrupt this if you would like, the numbers I always use in class is, you know, street level sex work. So what you where you'd see soliciting for clients and that on the street or, you know, being open for, for clients to come is a small, tiny 10% ish proportion of the industry. Yo, yeah, phew, I'm glad you're here. You're, you're working. No, no, this is great. Uh, whereas 90% of sex work is what we call indoors, right? So mm-hmm. in agent escort agencies, you know, brothel type environments, that sort of a thing, right? Right. Um, so these laws are always disproportionately going to uh, affect people based on their class. Where do you start? Right. Uh, Where can you do you have nowadays, for example, um, the type of resources and lack of criminal record to get access to a license? So how it's in. So I can't uh, I I, unfortunately don't have much to share with the experiences. But what we know is what we've been researching, thankfully, is the detrimental effect. And this will always uh, impact differentially based on class, uh, sexuality, racialization, all these things. Right. No. And those statistics that you mentioned too. Yeah. That's also kind of in line, but I was seeing and researching online as well, which is startling. Mm. Um, but maybe like, I know that a lot of the laws target that are centered around that 10% usually, but maybe we can actually go into the history of these laws being made. Not even about the history of the laws being made specifically, but talking about, um, laws centering around sex work in Canada and what that's looked like and some monumental moments, which we have, you know, talked about on the podcast, but it's been a little while as well, but wherever you'd like to start. Okay. Thank you. okay. <laughs> so this, so this, again, we've, we've, we've kind of exposed this uh, being part of this broader system that uh, dehumanizes uh, all vulnerable folks. And in particular, we see how all these now intersect honing in on the horse stigma so mm-hmm. this this anti-sex work has been built into a lot of feminist theory. Not all, as we pointed out. But there are only a handful of moments that I am aware of <laughs> where actual feminist theorists, academics, advocates, political humans, whatever, <laughs> have mm-hmm. impacted laws in North America. And funny you brought up porn. The two moments are around porn and sex work. Uh-huh. Really unfortunate moments. <laughs> yes. <laughs> May yes. quickly on the porn one from the early 80s? Sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah please. So in the early 80s, um, predominantly radical feminists combined with um, feminist jurisprudence theorists, which is just means just the philosophy of law. So feminists either interested in law or feminists interested in radical uh, that perspective we can't go into it today but that is okay <laughs> that's okay <laughs> um, going together and then got into the uh have, if, have you ever heard the phrase politics makes for strange bedfellows yeah so i have heard i haven't heard that <laughs> in a long time but yes. <laughs> so yeah <laughs> When get something done, sometimes you need to get into bed, quote unquote. <laughs> yes. Hmm, now that I'm saying this, I'm present to the judgmental uh, orientation of this. <laughs> I'll come up with something better in the future to explain. <laughs> so we have these uh, radical legal scholars, radical feminist legal scholars. They join with what was termed the religious right in the early 80s. These are fundamentalist Christians. Uh, they mm-hmm. came, they, they, created a group called the moral majority 
Um, there's this old song okay. lyric that I love that says, you are neither moral nor the, nor the majority. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, love it. so they join with the religious right. So fundamentalist Christians, deeply different values. But what they yes. agreed on was that porn was ruining the world. Right. So they join forces, challenge a number of different laws around the availability of pornographic materials in the U.S., particularly, I believe, in Chicago in the early 80s, were actually successful uh, in shutting down all all adult stores, um, supplies, things Mm. like this. Okay. This is another very unfortunate moment. And in fact, feminist arguments still continue to problematically inform censorship laws. Yes. Whole other thing. (laughs) But (laughs) Uh, yes, it's another episode in and of itself. (laughs) The other moment that I'm aware of where feminist theory impacted actual laws that are on the books are in regards to sex work laws. Right. Um, Where do I want to start from there? Yeah, where do you want to start? I know, like, obviously, Bedford is a pivotal case, and every sex worker, at least every Canadian sex worker that I know, is very much aware of the Bedford case. But if you want to give some spark notes, because we do have a lot of folks that are not in Canada as well. Thank you. (laughs) Okay, amazing. Go ahead. I wasn't sure. So thank you for the guidance as to, you know, uh, you know your audience best. So in 2013... Uh, based on the Bedford decision, Canadian sex work laws were deemed unconstitutional. Okay, so they mm-hmm. contravened or impeded some other basic human right. The basic right. human right that uh, our sex work laws in Canada impeded was one's right to do work safely. So the yes. laws themselves put sex workers at risk. I have a whole like, you know, three hour lecture into how that looks, but. We're, we're mm-hmm. cruising through here. <laughs> <laughs> and there are lots of episodes as well. If anyone wants to listen to that, there are tons. You could talk, you could listen to, I think, season two or three, the episode, um, oh my gosh, with Tamara O'Doherty from SFU spoke to that. We also have um, the episode with, oh my gosh, professor from York U that I can't remember the name of. I'll put it in the show notes for you all in case you need some extra priming. But Brandy, please continue. (laughs) Thank you. The basically what happened is the sex work laws were deemed unconstitutional. So they were written off the books. The federal government had one year to replace them. Okay. Sex work laws can basically go one of two directions. I'll do a quick overview of this. Um, two possible approaches to sex work laws are either legalization. So this is what most sex work laws in the world, if sex work is legal to some degree, you know, or some forms of it around the world. So classic examples of legalization include Holland, you know, Amsterdam's, uh, infamous red light district, uh, Nevada, Nevada. Yeah. Yeah. So basically this is saying sex work can happen, but it needs to happen in this particular space whether that's a yes. quote unquote red light district, a bunny farm, uh, you know, what, whatever it might be. Uh, licensing is often a part of that. Uh, mandatory yes. STI testing is typically a part of that. And the orientation is that we need specific laws to this labor exchange because there's something suspicious about it. And this is where we go to the heart of the erotophobia, you know, the fear of the erotic uh, in Christian culture combined with misogyny, right? Right. Worse than the erotic, women's erotic, you know, being erotic. (laughs) (laughs) Totally. Um, Because that's, I, this is a side, but I truly believe that is where a deep, deep part of our power comes from. Not for everyone, but, you know, that's uh, honoring that aspect of ourselves, I think is, is part of showing up in the world in our most amazing, powerful way. Sidebar. Agreed. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So this suspicion of sex work is built into feminist theory, and this is what informs legalization laws in specific ways that I'll get into in a second. Um, Mm -hmm. So the idea is that this is such an inherently just suspicious, potentially criminal, fraught with danger experience Uh, The assumption is that all clients are male, they are all abusers, Mm -hmm. Um, women are passive, you know, victims of this whole thing, 
that is right. built into feminist theory. That's where they're pulling on, right? You know, you're right. not hearing the religious right, you know, just to go back to that example, like these aren't Christian values, but these are, are feminist values for sure. Right. So that's the legalization saying we need laws to govern this unholy thing. And I'm using that yes. <laughs> intentionally, not, you know, to be clear. <laughs> Right, right. <laughs> the other option is decriminalization. So decriminalization, yeah. of course, uh, as you already know, and just a quick couple tidbits for your, you know, your listeners, are making it not illegal at all. Okay. Right. We would then relate to sex work labor exchanges like any other labor exchange. Are there crappy humans yes. out in the world? Yes. Yes. Are there exploiters. Yes. Yes. <laughs> this happens whether you are um, a nurse or whether you are an oil rig worker or whether you are a sex right. worker or a professor. <laughs> there are yeah. no humans out there. No question. But the laws that are used, but they're, they're not laws specific to sex work. So the, the theory behind decriminalization is that there's nothing unique or terrifying or frightening that warrants additional laws. All the laws I tell my students that govern you and I meeting in my office govern a sex work exchange. So when you come to my mm -hmm. office, hopefully no one's going to be sexually assaulting one another. Right. This is all right. I'm say. <laughs> <Let's> <laughs> I don't know if I need to have that, but I'm saying like like the, the premise is that we're two humans, you know, and yes, exactly. We we're get completely you. Completely safe in my office, all humans. <laughs> <laughs> correct. This is very correct. Anyone that no one's going to be physically assaulting anyone, um, you know. But the, those laws that say, oh, hey, um, something really awful happened. I, as a professor or I, as a student, are going to go report this because I feel I have the backing and I'm held as a valuable body in our society in a way that sex yes. workers aren't because of the whore stigma right yes so decrim is like no laws just all the other normal laws that we have and govern all labor relations that's what would be an operation so i was like right. joke with with my students and say for example being a professor is decriminalized <laughs> I, thank you for laughing sometimes <laughs> <laughs> of course the <laughs> The smile is that we giggle because it's not something that has been stigmatized being a professor, but it's, it's not like, but it's the same thing. But of course we giggle because sex work traditionally has been so stigmatized. So right. it's the exact same thing. It would just be a human getting up to their labor, you know, using all the skills they've acquired over their lifetime to do so. Of course. And this is like, you know, a lot of organizations and, and sex workers, I say, I say a lot, cause not everyone is advocating for this, but this, this model decriminalization is what most folks uh, are advocating for. May I quickly share right. something on this? Um, please, please. Directly connected. Uh, uh, one of my uh, teaching assistants from a uh, number of years ago uh, did their PhD research in New Zealand because, of course, New Zealand is yeah. kind of the mecca Decrim. of decriminalization. Yes. Uh, and I was at her PhD defense and the external, so you have to have someone from another university asking questions because you can't just have an insular system saying like, yes, right. all of our students are 100%. <laughs> 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 so their external um, examiner asked, well, what about research that doesn't support decrim? And I immediately thought in my head, it does not exist. You yeah. have position papers, you have moralistic arguments by academics that are supporting other things. My experience, and so then thankfully, Becky Ross, who was her yeah. supervisor, Amazing. outed that, that exactly. And I was like, oh, phew, okay, I wasn't out to lunch because I thought <laughs> it was my first thought. Any actual right. evidence based research that says, humans, tell me about your experience, you're involved. Right. That is my experience. Mm -hmm. I, I love like I, like you're like I, I, I believe the intention was you were opening it up, you know, for all sorts of different yes. perspectives. If I make totally. a bold statement, make a or make a bold, take a bold position in regards to research, it may have changed. Mm -hmm. That is my little, no. little insight. <laughs> no, this is really great to know as well, because um, I don't I follow a lot of people on Twitter a lot of people follow me as well. And there are still arguments of like, you know, people fighting for other 
like fighting for legalization. And I have had those episodes where people, because I, I also want to learn more about legalization as well. Because again, really trying to have like a good big overview of what is available out there in addition to sex work being criminalized. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> so yeah, and, if, and for those who are interested in those episodes, Check the catalog. There's lots yeah. there too. And so the really the heart of decrim is trying to deconstruct the whore stigma, making right. sex work a labor exchange like any other that has risks and benefits. That's it. It's of nothing course. special. It's nothing outside of the, the realm of our everyday life, really repositioning that as just human labor. Absolutely. And of course, the other model, the Nordic model, the Swedish model, Perfect. what's happening in Canada Perfect. model <laughs> and other places in the world, please. Please. Okay. So this is, um, uh, this is the moment where we're currently experiencing the impact of these feminist arguments. So yes. on, I think December 1st or December 14th, uh, 21st, whatever it was in December. Anyways, I remember the bit of a sad day. I remember the December celebration when the the Bedford decision came out and the less celebratory day when the following act emerged. Yes. In Canada in 2014, uh, basically the Canadian government chose to discard decrim, go the route of decriminalization. So I'm sorry. (laughs) I'm like, wait, (laughs) if you, if you like, edit that out or not, it's all good. (laughs) Well, that's okay. (laughs) Um, So the Canadian government in 2014 chose to go the route of legalization. The particular type of legalization that they chose to go with is called the Nordic model. Um, I have absolutely had Nordic students really resist that and say, don't put that shit on us. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> a Swedish model. I believe it was a German yes. student actually who had been a, a sex worker uh, previously. Oh, yeah. It was really it was a beautiful great. moment because I was using this language, uh, you know, and she was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I was like, thank you. Oh, no, mate, I'm, I stand corrected as well. I'm happy to use Swedish model moving forward as well. So thank and, you for educating me on yeah. that too. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's called... If you, if you don't, if you were not run into the Swedish model before, <laughs> it's called the Nordic <laughs> model. And this has come from the feminist argument that what our laws should do around sex work is quote unquote, dry up demand. Right. Push, make it hard for the client, assumed to be male still, to access these services, to make it so hard, uncomfortable, that they are going to stop utilizing these services. Now, anyone even remotely connected knows that that will never happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It does not work. It has not worked. No. And what it does, at, and this is, um, to me, what hurts so much as a feminist is that it positions women as victimless, aid, uh, victimless humans without agency. And I'm not okay with any sort of discourse that does that to another human. Right. Totally. Like, so basically what um, it criminalizes a client is meant to dry up demand, specifically the act. And this is where uh, the big, the big unveil, just everything becomes clear because you see it so (laughs) glaringly, obviously, but we're not talking about these things. So the Mm -hmm. act that emerged that was enacted in 2014 was called the Protection of Communities and Exploited Persons Act. Right. And oh my gosh. Now, CPA, <laughs> problematic on itself, even with the title, but okay. Exactly. <laughs> this for a moment. Who is this law about? Right. Exploited persons. Right. Only but... feminist <laughs> arguments of a very particular, you know, basically radical feminist arguments that assumed all. Uh, heterosexual relating is necessarily about violence and exploitation. I am committed to creating space for something other than that. (laughs) Yeah. Well, acknowledging inequality and misogyny, that is absolutely there, but we cannot Mm -hmm. erase our own agency. We can't give it up. This is like the threat of sexualized violence. You know, the threat, like sexualized violence is a major, huge issue. No question in all, you know, humans' lives. 
But particularly mm-hmm. within patriarchy, that is how control is so fiercely um, enacted on femme bodies by saying this right. is the threat. And the threat itself, if we accept that as inevitable, right? If we accept mm-hmm. lack of agency, being a passive victim as inevitable, we're bowing down, right? At, right. at the at the at this big phallus. <laughs> no, totally. I love that. <laughs> No, but it's problematic in so many levels, though, too, because, yeah, as you mentioned, we're talking about exploited persons, but we also need to understand the difference between an exploited person and also a a consenting adult in sex work, which are two different things. And, and of course, for my American listeners, with your laws down there with uh, SESTA-FOSTA, that's also the confusion between exploited persons and consenting Yes people in sex work. Yes. So, yes. So <laughs> consensual sex work with human trafficking very explicitly. Mm-hmm. This is the same ridiculous argument where people bring up sex work and some people arguing against it, bring up adolescent, like, you know, it, like, like underage sex work. That is not sex work. That is straight up not. abuse, exploitation. No one's yes. arguing that the same as humans who choose to bypass, um, you know, national boundaries to, uh, you know, to provide for their family and a new opportunity, their important mm-hmm. labor is being uh, erased. It's all yeah. forcing people to um, make deals with organized criminals because who's yeah. going to get you across those borders if legally we're not allowing this sort of thing to happen. So in right. making this problematic jump, like I always feel like the, 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 the jump from consensual adult sex work and human trafficking is like saying that's the same as choosing to cohabit with a human and kidnapping them. Like, <laughs> right. Are, right. Right. <laughs> in the realm of the same thing. <laughs> That was a good way of putting it, though. I've never heard anyone describe it like that, but it makes complete sense. Just like kind of like, yeah, I was I was actually watch. Uh, I was uh, had invited some beautiful humans in um, that were talking about uh, basically male sex work and you sort of the, the mm-hmm. differences because of oh, any yeah. I'm sure you've had episodes on this. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the, because the focus is, is on femme bodies because yes, that's it. That whore stigma. It's problematic because of their femme body within patriarchy, but I'll stop. Oh, yeah. Okay, I got to take a breath. I got to calm down. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I love that you're like the passion. I could, I could hear it so much in your voice, Brandy. And it, like, it's, it's frustrating. And I can hear your frustration with these ideas and, you know, what is now in law, which is concrete. Um, although it has been challenged in recent years, like last year, but again, with no success um, that benefits sex workers, which has been really frustrating Mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. (sighs) I I don't know where you want to go with this. Like, I mean, I would also have to end these like positively. (laughs) No, we cannot end here. (laughs) I will. Okay. How about this? Oh my goodness. I have a place to end this. Okay. Okay. So I have the very unique position especially in regards to working with the next generation. So I have this theoretical background where I work with passionate, inspired young students and they light my fire. Like they just, I love them. I'm like, I'm here to kind of support you from the background and you just like roar out there. I love it. I'm too old. (laughs) I'm like, I'm worried about my, not worried. I'm, I'm thinking about my mortgage and retirement at this point, you know, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so, but I also work with parents of youth who are terrified right now. Mm-hmm. The world's changing, the world's shifting, they're, they're terrified. And you see this uh, specifically around concerns for non-binary kids. You see this I've yes. seen in extreme situations around human trafficking brought up in a sexual health session, like with parents, like just bonkers uh, stuff. But anyways, let's set that yeah. up. So um, I was at a meeting with a group of fellow sexual health educators a while ago, and someone had shared how basically one of their parents, aside, made a, like a supportive parent, made reached out to say, "How can we talk about porn in a non-judgmental 
way when they argued. What our kids are seeing is not the old chicka bow wow, you know, porn <laughs> that we were seeing in the 70s, but they felt they were seeing the live exploitation abuse of kids. Mm. Okay. Okay. So right. like, Whoa, that hits real hard. Cause yeah. you know, like as someone that is deeply passionate about supporting kids and addressing childhood uh, sexual abuse in all humans lives, that, that hits hard. Totally. So I didn't know what to do with it, but something didn't fit. Right. Like, so, so I took it to my students and I said, Hey, what do you think about this? I'd love your expertise. Cause you're way more tuned into me. I like or, or tuned in than me. Uh, yeah, so yeah, they made the argument that one, if a child was finding stuff like this, they're doing a deep dive into like the the dark web. Sort of and, yeah, and like this is not you don't pull up Pornhub and you know like get that's the first thing on Pornhub. Exactly, yeah. like you'll have to actually stuff. actively search for it. Exactly, right? Yes, uh, and they said, and with amazing beautiful content creators like yourselves and others that self mastery self authorship self advocacy agency all of these beautiful things that that you're creating here and highlighting making the space for that's stronger than ever wow i love to hear that and your students came to this conclusion oh my gosh this makes me feel so great. Yeah. And also just like really is a validation of like, and I don't want to turn on me, but like the work that I'm doing here Absolutely. for the show. Absolutely. That's what, that's what I wanted to do. Yeah. That's, no, that's <laughs> that was so great question. though. <laughs> was I love it. Like, like that, like that this is, so I never, like there is always hope we can look at the, steaming pile of garbage that is our society <laughs> but know that by looking and acknowledging and acting we are making a difference and so that's why mm -hmm. i never i refuse to end on a bummer note i just will never yes. do it <laughs> so <laughs> i really wanted to acknowledge uh, just this such important work and such a difference that you're making so thank you Thank you, but also not without the help of you as well, Brandy. So this has been so great. I really, really am hoping that th this episode has spoken to a lot of folks and they were able to learn a lot more and learn, again, where these are rooted from, rooted in as well. And hopefully, again, they'll better equip listeners to go out and try to make some change <laughs> in the world. Hell yeah. Especially for sex workers. Yeah. So. Yes. But there are a few questions that came in from my wonderful intellectual audience as well that we can perhaps quickly go into because I know, again, look at the time. Hopefully we'll be okay, but we've got some 10 minutes to go. <laughs> but the first question is, um, I think this came from Kylie on Twitter slash X. How do you think the sex trade would be affected by universal basic income, equitable wages, and governments using housing first models? I feel very excited <laughs> about that possibility any human mm. working in sex work working in um you know uh domestic labor working in service industry working you know guaranteed income allows humans to thrive when we are mm. not forced to take on dangerous work in whatever right. form we're laboring when we are forced we don't feel like we're not gonna we're gonna starve next week or be kicked out of yeah. our place or else take this real sketch client, that is mm -hmm. where humans can thrive and they can create in the world and do their best laboring, laboring, you know, for themselves in the world, supporting other humans, uh, helping them heal around sexuality, you know, in this particular yeah. instance, that allows that. So it allows sex workers, like all humans deserve to be, you know, uh, yes. supported to thrive. So I would I could say that I could see nothing but amazing contributions from those things to sex workers. Me too. That is definitely a good goal too, as well. That's Absolutely. just what we all want. Mm -hmm. At least again, I'm, I'm also basing that on like what I think is right too. And I, I think there'd be some good positive change where we don't have to uh, operate on the survival basis. Exactly. Right. Um, the next question is a couple questions here uh from italian dude on uh twitter why do you think that taking porn off of why do they think that taking porn off of tumblr is good for women is it because of objectification 
or sex trafficking increases from sex work? So a couple different questions. So let's let's just deconstruct a little bit. So human trafficking is not in any way, shape, or form related to consensual adult sex work. Yes. Right. So that, you know, so like, so that, that's part of the connection. But indeed, certain strains of feminism, which I think is what this human is picking up on, radical feminists built anti-sex work feminism. They do truly believe that there is nothing possible in a hetero exchange uh, mm -hmm. other than exploitation. Right. And so the belief I feel deeply mistakenly, and I'll, I'll kind of wrap up in a second with like sort of how exactly I say it to my students, um, they're, uh, they're deeply mistaken that, yeah, taking porn off Tumblr will make a difference. And so, of course, right. what I say to my students is, hmm, do you really think if we were somehow magically able to erase porn tomorrow, we'd wake up in a world of inequality? Mm -mm. Not at all. Not in the, right. like, it's not even a possibility. Porn is a mirror of our society that is right. sexist, racist, ableist, like all these sorts of things. It's just a mirror. It's a human product that is a mirror of what we've created. So as we undo all of these other things, we'll see that the emergence of feminist porn since I was like, you know, uh, an undergrad is <laughs> mind blowing and beautiful and amazing. And right. the result of these kinds of conversations within the community, be like, ah, oh, screw that. I'll just make my own shit. Like, yeah, <laughs> it's so true. Cause there's like some agendas that are being made and for specific uh, audiences that porn is being made for. So a lot of it is made for the male gaze. Um, and of course, if you're ever on Pornhub and like you can see what's trending and stuff too, is a reflection of what is current and trending mm. in the world too. Um, and this is just like a small portion of it, but there are a lot of, um, new and emerging porn companies that are out there that are making like realistic porn too. I hate to use the word quote unquote ethical porn. Cause I've, again, there's a lot of stuff that you don't see behind the scenes when it comes to pornography. And there's a lot of acting and fantasy making involved in that process that you're not aware of. You don't see the consent forms and mm -hmm. all of the licenses that has to go, that goes into a porn production. Um, so yeah, I mean, maybe I should do an episode on that. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> too. No, I'm just like light bulb moment. Love it. But yeah, I, sorry. Was there anything that you wanted to add to that question too, Brandy? I was like, I was going off my own tangent no, there. No, no, no. <laughs> no, I don't believe so. But I, I, they're, they're, they absolutely like there are like this, this, the, the Italian dude or whatever. It is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They truly do believe that. Mm -hmm. They're obviously, yeah. I do feel deeply mistaken. No, totally. And and thank you, Italian dude, for all your questions lately. Because this, I know that from my understanding, he's pretty new to learning about oh, I love it. Uh, sex work and using this again as a resource to just learn more. So uh, by you being on the show, Brandy, this is immensely helpful, I'm sure. Thank you. <laughs> but before I let you go, where can we all find you if you want to be found? And Brandy's laughing at me because <laughs> I know you personally, but like, please tell the audience where and if they can find you. <laughs> This is the question that scared me the most because <laughs> I am a, a human who's deeply committed to not being uh, on online spaces at all. So, um, which is awesome. Interested and you know, uh, happen to be at UBC or living in the Lower Mainland. If you have kids, um, you know, do a little Google search, see if you can find a comprehensive sexuality education company to serve your children. <laughs> if you are... <laughs> <laughs> or at the university, you know, come check out one of my classes. I, I yes. yeah, I, I, I'm so sorry. I don't have any more to offer than that. <laughs> You're totally street, fine. Say, hey, I'm also passionate about sex worker rights. And I'll be like, oh, yes. five. <laughs> I love it. I love it. You know, uh, and I appreciate though, Brandy, because like, you know, as a person that is online all the time in front of a screen I'm just like one day I will get to my zen moment and you are a zen moment for me <laughs> thank, you. thank you I tried to create them <laughs> <laughs> and for everyone else that is listening at home um it's stripped by Sia on all pod, pod 
podcast podcast platforms so you could um find me pretty much anywhere um but if you do want to do some homework and want to do good for the show do for the good for the community you can rate five stars that really helps um other folks find the show as well um and of course if you really do enjoy this free resource and you enjoy the episodes and the people i'm bringing on uh you can also write a review as well on Apple Podcasts, become a Patreon subscriber again, patreon.com slash stripped by Sia. Um, but if you just want to get in touch with me and you, you can't find me online or you can't catch me online because sometimes I like my schedule right now is crazy. Um, and if you can't go out to where I'm sporadically being booked as a dancer, um, you can also find me actively on X or Twitter uh, under stripped by Sia on Instagram, which is stripped by Sia podcast and uh, stripped by Sia.com in case you're looking to come onto the show for any reason, or you want to pitch like your episode idea, um, please use contact form, please fill it up and please pitch me. I, I am actively recruiting right now for season seven, which is going to be up pretty soon. So stay tuned, but it is new episodes every Every single Sunday dropping at uh, midnight at Pacific Standard Time. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, thank you so much, Brandy, for coming on to the show today. Um, this was an awesome, I was going to say, this is an awesome class. <laughs> <laughs> an awesome lecture. <laughs> so lovely to have you on. I'm so glad we're finally able to do this. So thank, thank you, thank you, you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs>